my feeling about the politics slash CEO slash why our culture rewards this type of behavior is something along the lines of when you're voting for somebody for office, you want to hear somebody tell you, I should say most people want to hear somebody tell you, we are going to solve problem X. Here's how we're going to do it. My plan is going to solve this problem. It's homelessness, it's drugs, it's uh, not enough housing for renters. And this is what we're going to do. And this is going to cause this to happen. And this is going to solve this problem. And to say that with total confidence. And while we do need to be confident as leaders, there, I think, is a beyond confidence, delusional grandiosity, which pervades the political realm. And unfortunately, people are drawn to that rather than to somebody who said, we're going to look at the data. There are these three or four ideas which are supported by examples here and there. We're hoping that this is going to make a positive impact on our community. We're going to iterate as we go along. That kind of person, in my opinion, is not likely to get elected because they want somebody, the voters in general, want somebody to say, this is a problem and together we are going to fix it. Unfortunately, that's delusional and I think falls into this category. Yes. And the other side of that, because, you know, on one hand, it is that personality type that people tend to assume is a leader or is exuding leadership. And the other hand, it's like there's this public amnesia where there is this refusal of the public to empower themselves. And that is the tricky part of things because there is an empowerment, a learning dynamic and a willingness to look at history and go, yeah, you know, these people do this all the time and they never really fulfill all of the obligations or within reason have enough time to fill these obligations while they're in office. Prakuchan, earlier you said that the category of narcissist is intended to include a positive self-image side, which would be a positive narcissism along a spectrum all the way to pathological narcissism and that you prefer not to look at it that way because although that's the prevailing wisdom, nobody really speaks of it that way when studies are done, but rather only looks at the pathological side of things. And that to me speaks to my point that maybe this is a category problem or an um, terminology problem where it's hard to know how to label the pursuit of that kind of trait in a positive sense. So are we going to begin saying that there's a positive side to narcissism and we need to stop being so uh, overly empathic, if that's where we are? Or is it better to make another category, you know, the subtle art type of thing, and learn to have a thick skin while still having a heart. I have attempted to balance this trait in myself. And I think from childhood, I've been more on the self-focused side rather than on the others focused side. But in adulthood, I have intentionally trained myself through practices to put others first and to care about people, things like that. And the way I've tried to balance this is, especially in a position, a leadership position to just let everything wash over me like water off a duck's back, no matter what criticism it is, no matter what accusation it is or innuendo, unless there is something specific. In other words, when we were talking about this, you said that, and that seemed to be bullying or that seemed to be mean or something I said, something I did. You did this. You know, you, you rode in my car and you didn't pay for gas when we went to the gas station. You know, that's something. That's something I can hold in my hand, I can chew on, and I can give a response and say, you know what, I'm sorry, I didn't think about it. Or actually, I did Venmo you, you know. Whatever it is, I could be guilty. Uh, but 
what I found is most of the time there's really nothing to hold. There's nothing to chew on. There's just bad feelings. There's just innuendo. And when that kind of thing takes place, I more or less completely ignore it. Don't even respond to it unless I have a pre-existing relationship with the person. And that in that sense, behaving towards that kind of negativity towards me in a psychopathic type of way for tongue in cheek using that language. Whereas I'd like to have a heart and remain completely open to correction when there's something to chew on. Where's the beef? What I have found, Brittany, that's been uh, really revealing and, and troubling, but I think universal in my experience in church leadership, and it's true in business too, but maybe a bit more in church, is the desire to empower people and people's unwillingness to be empowered. And this is actually one of the storylines in the Bible, ironically, uh, not encouraging people to be disempowered, but saying, why are you asking for a king? You know, Israel in the Old Testament demands a king. Everybody else has a king. They didn't have a king. They just had a set of ways that they were supposed to live. Same goes for the priest picture. The picture of the priest is here's a person who stands between you and God. So on the one hand, they will tell you what God wants you to do. And on the other hand, you can't approach God without going to this person. And in terms of a, a human, just like you and I, this is not a very healthy way to think about leadership in church. Obviously, there are uh, certain groups that favor the priest picture more than others. So I think it's a universal tendency in people, and I, I suppose it would extend to politics as well, to say, we don't want to be empowered. We want to be taken care of. We want you to tell us that you will take care of us. So going back to the spiritual world, the spiritual leadership world, no matter how much I might say, it isn't me. Don't look at me. Don't come to me as though you need me in order to access God. I have a certain role to play. I have a certain gifting to use. I have a certain place in the community, but I'm not the guy. Even with that kind of teaching, and as clearly as possible, there's still a large number of people who, from the heart, just want somebody to tell them what they're supposed to do. Because it takes away the hard work. You know, it takes away the creative work. It takes away some of the pain. If you just say, do this thing three times a week, do this thing each morning. Um, and I think I made my point, so I'll stop there. But it's a, it's a tendency to just say, you tell me what to do. You tell me what we're going to do. And I look up to you to make the decisions for me. And that absolves individuals of the challenge of walking their own story and of connecting to God their, on their own and of, politically speaking, making decisions for their community, which involves their voice and their action and their hands and feet. And many of us resist that. So in lieu of taking responsibility for our life, we will accept the delusions of a narcissist promising us a great future, but in reality, just taking from us. And we, we go into their story because as you were saying, it's such a powerful, powerfully held story. This is who you are. This is who I am. This is how we can do it. And that's, as you pointed out, that's the grand scheme. If there is one is to draw everybody into this clear yet delusional vision for how it's all going to go. Welcome, Brittany, and thank you for sharing your experience. You've given this room a very positive direction in terms of the, in terms of discussing how this condition manifests in day-to-day -day life and how it affects those especially who become entangled with it involuntarily. And in that regard, you've articulated this entire thing so well. There are definitely some points that I'm looking forward to discussing in the next few chats. And Matt, this is probably... Uh my fault in not mentioning narcissistic personality disorder as the pathological condition and narcissism as the quality because officially that is what narcissism is with healthy self-regard on one end like i said so uh, that may be an error on my part uh, but then again i would still say that if 
it's always studied as a pathological condition. Uh, I'd rather not include healthy self-regard in narcissism. I would include it in high self-efficacy. So, yeah. Brittany, you've uh, articulated very accurately the tendency of uh, narcissist pathological to want to feel in control at all times and impose that imagined reality on whoever they're entangled with. Um, and the moment things don't go their way, they will start throwing a fit and their fragile ego will resurface. And, you know, in my observation, I've noticed that post this, what happens is they will start using very consciously tactics of emotional push and pull. Now, in my experience, it was a conscious use, but it could be that people use this unconsciously as a defense mechanism as well. Um, in my experience, though, uh, this emotional blackmail, emotional volatility, this, these games of push and pull, they almost begin immediately, very consciously, to bring things back in their control. That's a very interesting idea, Matt. I don't think it's just that, though. Because, of course, people want uh, somebody to lead the way. They want to look up to somebody to give them rules and give them tasks just so that they don't have the feel, the uncertainties of their own lives. But I don't think it's just that. I also think that people like somebody to blame as well. That's why we put up with, you know, corrupt politicians, bad parents, and maybe even abusive relationships just so that when we are in those positions, we can just blame the other person for every single thing that's wrong. And we don't have to introspect our own lives. And we can escape whatever misery and suffering that we are causing to ourselves and to maybe people around us as well. Because of course, when you have such a big tyrannical monster in front of you, any mistake that you do by comparison is small. And that's the shadow that we like to hide in. I appreciate your point. Absolutely. It's the flip side of what I was saying, and it shares in common the refusal to accept responsibility for your own actions, either positively or negatively, and the consequences and the weight of our decisions. 